Welcome to Bedtime Scaries. May you always find your way home in the dark. May you always wake up where you lay down your head. And may you always have a friend close by, whether you know it or not. Tonight's story is part two of Pen Pal by Dathan Arbach, titled Balloons. When I was five years old, I went to an elementary school that, from what I've come to understand, was really adamant about learning through activity. The school was part of a new program designed to allow children to rise at their own pace, and to facilitate this, the administration encouraged teachers to come up with inventive and engaging lesson plans. Part of the underlying rationale, I think, was that if teachers could trick the students into forgetting that they were at school, or that they were doing homework, students would be more enthusiastic about their work. Moreover, if the students cultivated an eagerness for school right out of the gate, then the general apathy that has its way of creeping into most students as the years go by could be staved off. To this end, each teacher was given the latitude to create his or her own themes that would run for the duration of the grade. And all the lessons in math, reading, etc. would be designed in the spirit of the theme. These themes were called groups. There was a space group, a sea group, an earth group, and the group I was in, community. Regardless of the creativity of the curriculum, in kindergarten in the United States, Aside from very basic writing skills, you don't learn much except how to tie your shoes and how to share, and as a result of that, most of the grade isn't very memorable. This is particularly true if you enter kindergarten with most of the writing skills that they expect you to develop by the time you've exited. As one of the students who was in this position, I find that as I look back now, I remember the people fairly well, but the actual curriculum remains mostly a mystery to me but perhaps that isn't all that unusual. I do remember two things clearly. I was the best at writing my name in the correct way, which I had mastered sometime before entering the grade, and the balloon project, which was really a hallmark of the community group, since it was a clever way to show how a community functioned at a very basic level. The concept of the balloon project was fairly straightforward. Each student would release a balloon with a note attached, and then would wait for a response from whoever happened to find the balloon. We would ask them to enclose a picture of their area, if possible, and provide a return address so that we could become pen pals. The teacher would post each picture on a large map that she had hung on one of the walls in the classroom, and this would help us see not merely how far the balloon had traveled, but how important communication was in bringing a community together. I remember our project being on a Friday, because the culmination of weeks of discussion and preparation for this exciting event made it feel as if I was having a three-day weekend. The rocky start with which I had begun kindergarten had finally smoothed, and I talked excitedly with my friend Josh each day as we eagerly awaited the Friday launch. The morning of the launch, all the students walked into the classroom and saw that there was a fully inflated helium balloon tied off with a ribbon taped to each desk. Our tables were laid out in a grid, and so the balloons had the same arrangement as planted trees in a lot. From the right angle, they would all line up, but if you moved just a little to your left or right, they would fan out and you could see them all again. We had known about this project since the first week of class, so we had known, at least abstractly, what to expect on balloon day. Despite the foreknowledge, however, walking into the classroom full of balloons gave the room the same ambiance as that of a birthday party. And, in response, the kids behaved as if it were one. The balloons were all different colors, and upon seeing this, the students began bartering heatedly with one another for their favorite colors almost immediately. It took the teacher much longer than normal to organize and stifle the students, but gradually we were subdued at our desks and were asked to take out our assignments for the day. The preceding Friday, the teacher had sent us home with instructions to write a note with our parents' assistance. All of the notes had to follow a loose structure, but we were allowed to be creative within those boundaries. My note read something like this. Hi, you found my balloon. My name is blank, and I attend blank elementary school. You can keep the balloon, but I hope you write me back. 
I like Mighty Max, exploring, building forts, swimming, and friends. What do you like? Write me back soon. Here is a dollar for the mail. At the bottom of the page, I drew a little stick figure saying, Hi! in a word bubble next to his head. And after a few moments of consideration, I drew a balloon in his hand. On the dollar I had brought from home, I had written four stamps right across the front, which my mom had said was unnecessary, but I thought it was genius, so I did it. Sitting on each of our desks was a marker, a pen, a piece of paper, and an envelope. The first part of the project for that day was to transcribe the notes we had composed at home, after which we would put it in the envelope and attach it to the balloon. If we wanted to, we could draw a picture on it. There was a palette of paint with some brushes and cups of water sitting on a long table just in front of the teacher's desk, for kids who elected to paint a picture on their note. It was a sunny day, and those who wished to paint their note were told to finish by a certain time so the letters could be set out to dry in the sun. Only a handful of kids were brave enough to send their art out into the world. After the teacher had finished giving us our instructions, most of my peers returned to their rowdy attempt at trading balloons, while a teacher began assisting the few students who had forgotten to bring their letters to class. As for me, I started on my note immediately, because I didn't want to be sloppy. My handwriting, at least back then, was quite nice. With the guidance of my mother, I had been practicing writing while simultaneously learning how to read for a fair amount of time before I begun kindergarten. Since the letter was already written, all that was left for me to do was to copy it down verbatim. I had broken my left arm some weeks before, so the plaster cast made it difficult to reposition and steady the paper as I went. But finally, I simply laid the heavy arm on the paper, leaned onto it, and began transcribing, feeling thankful that I was right-handed. I took care with each stroke of the pen, because I knew that I wouldn't be able to erase. I had never written anything important in pen before. Everything of any consequence that I had ever marked on the page was only as permanent as I wanted it to be. But now, each straight or curved line I marred the paper with had a tint of finality to it, and it only served to threaten the stability of my penmanship even more. But this was the way it had to be. Several years before, when the students were still writing their notes in pencil, there had been a storm the day after the balloons were released. Virtually no letters were mailed back. Although there was no way to determine exactly why that had been, it was suggested that the pencil marks washed out much too easily. So to be safe, we should use ink from that point on. I drew the last line on the paper and sat back with satisfaction. I interrupted my teacher's conference with another student to show her the letter, and she approved enthusiastically and sent me back to my seat. With my remaining time, I took to decorating the balloon. Mine was red, and that suited me just fine, with no interest in trading my balloon for another color. I tried to think of what I could draw on it. I decided that Spider-Man would make the most sense. I got to work and spent about two minutes trying to figure out how to draw Spider-Man's head before I realized that it was impossible. Deciding that a plain balloon was actually better than one with a drawing on it, I put the marker away and went to talk to my best friend Josh. It usually took him a bit longer to write things because he was left-handed, and would occasionally smudge what he had just written as his hand moved against the paper from left to right. I went over to him that day, partially to help him, but mostly because I wanted to invite him to my house after school for what would have been our first sleepover. When the teacher told us to return to our desks, I walked back but froze as my letter came into view. It was wet. I looked around to see if someone might betray himself by laughing, but all my peers were sitting attentively at their desks now. I craned my neck over to their workspaces and saw that quite a few kids had painted pictures. I realized that someone who must have been trying to dry a paintbrush had carelessly sprinkled water droplets onto my note. The ink had already begun to run in outward arcs where the water touched it. The letter was still legible in parts, but some words were nearly obliterated. Others were simply incomprehensible. Rather than being a fan of exploring, according to my letter, I was an avid exploiting enthusiast. I wanted to know who did this. I felt that I had put more effort into writing that letter than any of my peers, so for someone to so carelessly deface it was unthinkable. But there were so many kids who had painted pictures on their notes that it would take too long to attempt to figure out who might have vandalized my paper. 
attempting to repair, or at least minimize, the damage seemed more pressing. There was no time to recreate the letter in its entirety. I thought about rewriting just the damage parts, but if I crossed them out and tried again, my pen pal would think that I didn't know how to spell. I reassured myself that there would be other letters and other chances, and walked quickly to the table where the paints were. I tore off a paper towel and tried to dry off the note as best I could without smearing the reanimated ink. The teacher called us alphabetically to the far side of the classroom. One by one, we stood in front of a wall-sized map of the city and smiled with our balloon tethers held tightly in our fists. The mechanical whirring of the Polaroid camera repeated as each of us had our picture taken. After the film had developed, we put the photographs in our envelopes along with our letters. The teacher handed each of us another letter to enclose, which I imagine explained the nature of the project while also expressing appreciation for their participation in it. The pen pals would have been provided with a mailing address of the school and asked to mail their letters promptly so that the project could progress. That was the whole project. Doing these simple things would allow us to build a sense of community without having to leave the school and do it safely. We could also practice our reading and writing through our correspondences without even realizing we were doing schoolwork. Everyone, faculty and students alike, loved this project, and it had been a huge success every year, with the exception of the year it stormed. We marched single file out of the back door of the classroom and into the courtyard outside. Keeping our formation, we pressed our backs against the wall of the building so that we could pose for a group photograph. One of the students, a boy named Chris, had become so excited upon exiting the classroom that, as soon as he saw the sky above, he let his balloon go and started cheering. I think this enthusiasm would have spread quickly if the teacher had been a little slower in scolding him. Now you're going to be the only one in the picture without a balloon, Chris! She snapped. The boy started to cry. He had a sore throat, so his complaints were hoarse and raspy. I remember thinking that he sounded funny. And I suppose there's some justice in the fact that I caught his sore throat a couple days later. I would like to say that in a demonstration of solidarity, at least one other student let a balloon go, or even better, that we all let ours go and stood by Chris, balloonless and proud. But this was kindergarten. Most of the kids stood there with restrained amusement, while others advertised just how funny they found Chris's plight. In the end, Chris sulked at the very edge of the group picture and held his left hand out of frame clutching an imaginary balloon with a frown etched so firmly on his face that it seemed like it might just outlast the lifetime of the picture that he posed for. After the photo was taken, we formed a circle around the teacher who said a few things about friendship and community that I imagine went mostly unheard by the students, whose attention was now myopically focused on loosening the grip on their balloon's tethers. When her speech was finally over, the countdown began. Five, four... Three, two, one and a half. There was a collective groan in protest. She did this frequently. Although we didn't know what this number was, we knew it was a way of stalling. One! All at once, each kid yelled whatever their chosen launch word was, and the courtyard became a carnival, as two dozen brightly colored floating balls filled the sky. We ran chasing our balloons and tried desperately to distinguish them from the other ones of the same color. Cross currents and updrafts flung the balloons wildly in different directions, and their human counterparts mirrored their movements on the ground below. Several kids collided with one another as they ran frantically chasing their balloons, but instead of fights, there were laughs. Despite the ruckus, I heard a rogue blast off, and shot my eyes down from the sky to see Chris releasing a bright green balloon that the teacher had just given him so that he could participate. As the balloons reached ever upwards, it became almost impossible to track my own balloon, and this brought a new kind of excitement. Where would it go? Who would find it? I remember that day so clearly. When I think about it, I can almost feel a phantom sun on my face, and can sometimes just faintly, smell my teacher's perfume. It was one of the happiest days I ever had. Over the next couple weeks, the letters started to roll in. Most of the notes came, as requested, with pictures of different landmarks, and the teacher would pin each picture on the big wall map that we had taken our Polaroids in front of. 
Arranging them directly on the map made it easy to see where the letter had come from, and just how far the balloon had traveled. We did this at the very beginning of class each day, which was a really smart idea because we actually looked forward to coming to school to see if our letters had come in. For the duration of the year, we would have one day a week where we could write back to our pen pal, or another student's pen pal, in case our letter had not come in yet. Day after day, I arrived at school excited, but left dejected at the fact that my letter hadn't arrived yet. There were other students who didn't receive their letters either. Not every balloon would be found, and this was something the teacher had reminded us of frequently, but this fact didn't offer me any consolation. I worried that all my hard work had been for nothing, and I started to resign myself to the idea that I would have to write to one of my peers' pen pals if I wanted to have anyone to write to at all. But then, one day it came. My letter was one of the last to arrive. Upon entering the classroom, I looked at my desk and saw that, once again, there was no letter waiting for me. But as I sat down, but as I sat down, the teacher approached me and asked me about the letter I had written. She asked me if I remembered what I had sent away with the balloon. I was a bit taken aback, but I told her about what I wrote and about the dollar and about the drawing. When I finished, she brought her hand from behind her back and said with a smile, I think this is for you then. I was delirious with excitement, and my confusion regarding her question about the letter I had sent ended when I saw the envelope. On the back, right over the seal, there was a drawing of a stick figure holding a balloon, just like the one I had drawn. The letter really was for me. I must have looked ecstatic, because as I was about to open it, she put her hand on mine to stop me and said, Please don't be upset. I didn't understand what she meant. Why would I be upset now that my letter had come? I was mystified that she would even know what was in the envelope, but... Of course, I know now that she had screened the contents to make sure there was nothing obscene. But, sitting at that desk, I was baffled by her concern that I would be disappointed. My balloon hadn't gotten lost. The person who found it hadn't just thrown my letter away. All other possible details seemed negligible and insignificant to me. But when I opened the envelope, I understood her reaction. There was no letter. The only thing in the envelope was a Polaroid, but I couldn't make out what the image was. It looked like a patch of desert, but it was too blurry to decipher. It appeared as if the camera had been moved while the picture was being taken. I turned the Polaroid over, but there was nothing on the back. It was just a Polaroid, and nothing more. There wasn't even a return address. I realized that I wouldn't be able to write back. And since there was no way to tell where the picture was taken, it couldn't even be placed anywhere on the map. Instead, my teacher tacked it on the side of the map next to the compass rose. Out of the way, but still a part of the project. I was crushed. When I got home, my mom asked me how my day was, and so I told her. I told her I'd gotten a letter from my pen pal and she became visibly excited. I think she had always known that I might never get a response. And as time went on and my potential contact remained silent, her consolations shifted from optimism in possibility and potential to realism and acceptance. So, when I actually received something, she was both shocked and overjoyed for me, since she knew how badly I had wanted someone to write me back. When I told her that there was no letter, only a Polaroid, she joked that maybe my pen pal had bad handwriting and was embarrassed after seeing how good mine was. I didn't think this was actually the case. Uh, my letter had been damaged before it even touched the sky. But my mother's words always seemed to have the ability to make me feel better. So I accepted her rationale, and I felt happy that I had gotten anything at all. The school year pressed on, and the letters had stopped coming for nearly all other students. After all, you can only continue a written correspondence with a kindergartner for so long. This was expected by the teacher, and the lull was worked into the curriculum. Our Friday letter writing sessions slowly morphed into other projects, and everyone, including myself, had lost interest in the letters almost completely. I still thought about the picture from time to time. In some way, I still felt as if I had been cheated, but then again, 
There were students who had received nothing at all, because their balloons had apparently been lost or disregarded. Recognizing this, I realized that I would seem greedy to those kids, and so any time I felt compelled to complain, I would bite my tongue. Gradually, I internalized this pretended acceptance and simply moved on, both in appearance and thought. Until I got another envelope. My excitement was rejuvenated fully, and I secretly reveled in the fact that I had just gotten a letter while nearly all the other pen pals had abandoned their involvement. Most of my classmates had written back and forth with their pen pals several times, and the ones who received nothing at all were probably the victims of bad weather and bad luck. The first envelope I had received, however, was tantamount to someone laughing in my face. It seemed as if someone had gone through just enough trouble to let me know that he didn't care. Holding the correspondence in my hand validated my objections to the original arrival. It made sense that I received another delivery. There had been nothing but a blurry picture in the first one. This was probably to make up for that. But, again, there was no letter at all. Just another picture. This one was more distinguishable, but not fully comprehensible. The camera was sharply angled towards the sky. The photograph caught the top corner of a building in the bottom left of the frame, but the rest of the image was distorted by a lens flare from the sun. I turned the Polaroid over, but again, there was nothing written on the back. My teacher put her hand on my shoulder and said, A picture's worth a thousand words, right? Before walking away towards her desk. A picture's worth a thousand words. I had never heard that said before, and I sat there for a while trying to decide if I believed it. Because the balloons didn't travel very far, and because they were all launched on the same day, the board became a bit cluttered fairly quickly. If a letter came in with a picture of a place that wasn't already overrepresented on the map, it would be displayed, but otherwise the correspondences were distributed to their recipients, so we could take them home as keepsakes for the project. A week or two before school year ended, the remaining pictures were taken off the map and handed out to their owners. My best friend Josh took home the second highest number of pictures at the end of the year. His pen pal was very cooperative and sent him photos from all around the neighboring city. Josh took home, I think, four Polaroids. I took home nearly 50. The envelopes had all been opened by the teacher, but after a while I stopped even looking at the pictures. However, the photographs were, if nothing else, a collection, so I saved them in one of my dresser drawers that housed my other collections. The problem with collections, I had found, was that either there was simply no way to gather all the things in the series, because there was no end to it, or there would always be a last item that made your collection incomplete. In my mind, I suppose, the things in the collection weren't as valuable as the completeness of the collection itself. My drawer was a mausoleum of my incomplete collections of rocks, baseball cards, comic book cards, and little miniature baseball batting helmets that my mother and I would ceremoniously buy from a vending machine at Winn-Dixie after t-ball games. I put the photos in a box and slid it next to my baseball cards. With the school year over and summer break just beginning, I turned my attention to other things. For Christmas, midway through my year of kindergarten, my mom had gotten me a small snow cone machine. It didn't make very good snow cones, but the fact that I could make them at home now delighted both Josh and me. He came to covet the machine so much that his parents bought him a slightly nicer one for his birthday, towards the end of the school year. Snow cones produced by Josh's machine were much bigger and were made much faster than when we would use my machine. Several weeks into summer break, we decided to take a break from exploring the woods. We would pool our resources and set up a snow cone stand to make money. We thought we would make a fortune selling snow cones at one dollar. Josh and I lived in different neighborhoods, so we had a conversation about where we would set up shop. As one might have expected, we both wanted to locate the business at our respective houses, so before we even had the cups for shaved ice, we had our first disagreement. His neighborhood was a bit nicer than mine, but many of the older houses in my neighborhood had slightly larger yards, and as such, 
people who actually cared for them had to be outside for longer amounts of time in order to do so. There were also simply more people in my neighborhood, since there were many houses that stood on fairly small plots of land, and the ongoing construction around where I lived meant there were always people outside on the weekends. Josh rebutted by claiming that his neighborhood was nicer than mine was, and this was a thought that had never occurred to me before. I became indignant, and our capacities to engage in a civil and rational discussion became exhausted. Ultimately, I won by trumping all of Josh's legitimate reasons by exclaiming that it was my idea, so we would do it at my house. The first weekend was a disaster. We had both used our machines before, but to be quite honest, we simply weren't very good snow cone producers. We had two bottles of syrup, cherry and cherry, so there wasn't to be much variety in terms of flavors. More to our detriment, we had never completely figured out how to best pour the syrup into the ice, or how much to pour for that matter, so most of our customers had their hands covered in overflowing red dye when they squeezed the paper cups to take their snow cones away. We made about six dollars and stopped for the day. We didn't fare much better the second weekend. Josh and I had gotten the hang of the syrup for the most part, but I had the idea that we would use crushed ice in the machines in order to make the snow cones more quickly since I thought the smaller chunks of ice would shave faster. Instead, the crushed ice became jammed between the blades and the plastic rotor inside the machine and broke my snow cone maker immediately. This machine was one of the nicest things that I owned, so I became flustered when I couldn't get it to work. I took the top off and looked inside. I could see the chunks of ice that were jamming the blades, so I picked up the plastic case and banged it on the table a few times in an attempt to dislodge them. Looking up, I could see a potential customer coming. I needed to clear the jam quickly. Without thinking, I pushed my hand down into the cavity of the snow cone machine and began carefully wrestling the ice out of the space between the blades and the inside wall. I looked up again and recognized the person from the weekend before. Forgetting that Josh's machine was working fine, I turned my attention back to the problem so I could be ready for a first return customer. I could feel the ice begin to give and the pivot a little as the heat from my fingers melted it. I almost had the problem resolved when I heard Josh say, Hey, what's this button do? I looked over to Josh and saw he had his finger on the start button of my machine. Reflexively, I yanked my hand out of my snow cone maker, my middle finger catching the blade on the way out. There was a period of just a few seconds where I thought I had just scratched myself but a thin red line soon began to quickly draw itself horizontally along the underside of my finger. I watched as the line widened and spread as blood began dripping from my hand. I shouted at Josh while he prepared a snow cone on his machine for our anticipated customer, and he said that he was only joking, that he wasn't really going to push the button. He looked genuinely remorseful from what I could tell, and though he seemed to have a problem looking at my hand as he apologized. I think now that Josh had a fear of blood. Josh had already finished pouring the syrup before the customer got to the table, and he held it gingerly so that it wouldn't melt. Holding my finger in the opposite hand, I looked around for something to wrap it in. By the time the customer got to our stand, the blood had welled up in the tight fist that I was making around the finger and had begun dripping down my forearm. As Josh held the snow cone out to the man, I saw our patron's eyes dark back and forth from the cherry red ice to my blood red hand. His expression changed from concern to amusement, and finally he said, You boys sure put a lot of yourself into your business. The man followed his exclamation with a guffaw so long and loud I could still hear it when I went back to the house to show my mom what I had done to myself. When I got back outside, Josh said that the man had bought the snow cone. We decided to quit while we were ahead, so we packed up and went inside. It turned out that my machine wasn't irreparably damaged. Once the ice melted, the jam was cleared, and it began to work again without difficulty. This was good news, because business picked up the following weekend. Josh and I had taken a substantial break from our explorations in the wood due to the patch of trees that blocked our path, and during that hiatus, I had made a new sign that said in big, bold letters, FREE SNOW CONES! Josh said matter-of-factly that we weren't just going to give snow cones away, and I laughed as I pointed at what I had written in faint pencil just under the advertisement. Just kidding. 
My neighbor, an elderly woman named Miss Maggie, was our first customer that day. She pretended to be outraged by our ruse, but happily paid us. Before we left, she told us that she would look for us in the lake later that day if we decided to go swimming. We had many more customers that day, and they were all good sports about our trick, including the man who returned for a third time. We made $18 that day, and a bit less the following weekend. The fifth weekend would turn out to be our last day of business. My mom would take my snow cone machine away only a couple days later. When I protested, she told me she didn't want me cutting my hand off, although I had injured myself weeks ago. Even at that age, I thought this late reaction was bizarre. Because Josh and I both had a snow cone machine, we each had a separate stack of money that we put together into one pile, and then we split it evenly. When there was an odd number of bills, we would play rock, paper, scissors to see who would get to keep the extra bill. We called this decision-making ritual gaming. That day, we made a total of $17, primarily from the same people we had been selling to since we started our business. After we stopped selling for the day, Josh was divvying up the spoils, and as he paid out my fourth dollar, I was consumed by a feeling of profound bewilderment. The dollar said, four stamps. I must have vocalized my surprise because Josh noticed my shock and asked if he had miscounted. No, that dollar... Josh, that's the dollar I sent! What? That's the dollar, man! That's the one I sent! What dollar? What are you talking about? Seeing the dollar here in my hands befuddled me, and I struggled to compose myself so I could explain more clearly. From the balloon! I sent off the balloon, remember? I sent it off with the balloon, remember? I put it in the envelope with my letter. Josh pondered this for a moment before deciding what this meant. That's so cool! He shouted. As I thought about it, I came to agree. The idea that the dollar had made it right back to me after changing so many hands staggered me. I had no way of knowing how far the balloon had traveled, but whatever the distance had been, it was still amazing. Whoever found my balloon must have bought some stamps at the post office, and then slowly and incrementally the dollar had worked its way right back to me. I rushed inside to tell my mom, but my excitement coupled with her distraction from an in-progress phone call made my story incomprehensible to her, to the point that she responded simply by saying, Oh wow, that's neat, just to placate me. Frustrated, I ran back outside and told Josh that I had something to show him. We thundered up the steps to my front door and ran immediately to my room. I opened the collection drawer, took out the box of envelopes, and showed Josh some of the pictures. I started with the first picture, and we went through about ten before he lost interest in looking at the poorly angled and meaningless Polaroids. I grew irritated at his disinterest. My pen pal sent these pictures, and today, after countless transactions, the dollar he had used to send the photographs had landed right back in my hand. This was almost too much for me to take in. The sheer improbability of it all. Even the most minor alteration would have changed things entirely. If Josh had paid the first dollar to himself, I probably would never have even noticed my returning defaced currency. Josh, however, had become completely disengaged and asked if I wanted to go play in the ditch before his mom came to pick him up. I responded with a distracted and somewhat dismissive agreement as I shuffled through the envelopes. I'm not sure how the routine was born, but the ditch had become a battleground to Josh and me. Nearly every time we stepped into the ditch, one of us would lob a clod of dirt at the other, and this would catalyze a full-scale assault in both directions. It probably started with a single, playful toss of dried mass of compacted dirt, but it became nearly impossible for us to step into that arena without almost instantly entering into a standoff. We enjoyed these battles so much and sought them out with such frequency that the ditch, lowercase, became the ditch, capitalized, without us ever noticing. That day was no exception to the rule of combat. But the war game was persistently interrupted by rustling in the woods around us. We were used to these sounds. There were raccoons and stray cats that lived in the woods by my house. But there seemed to be too much noise coming from the forest floor for it to be caused by either of those things. As we continued our battle, 
We traded guesses at what the source of the ruckus was in an attempt to scare one another. Playing games like these gradually evolved into the games I would play by myself when exiting the woods as the sun rolled away. My last guess was that it was a mummy, but in the end Josh kept insisting it was a robot because of the sounds that we heard. As we were leaving, I said that if it was a robot, it would have made much more noise, but Josh shook this off and became a little serious. He looked me right in the eyes and said, You heard it, didn't you? It sounded like a robot. You heard it too, right? I had heard it, and since it sounded mechanical, I agreed it was probably a robot. It's only now, looking back, that I understand what we heard. When we got back to my house, Josh's mom was waiting for him at the dining room table with my mom. Josh told his mom about the robot, our moms laughed, and Josh went home. My mom and I ate dinner, and then I went to bed. I tried to sleep, but I was feeling restless. Josh might not have been interested in the photos, but after seeing that dollar, I could think of virtually nothing else. Before too long, I climbed down from the top bunk and took the box of envelopes out of my dresser drawer. I took out the first envelope, set it on the floor, and placed the blurry desert Polaroid that had been inside of it on top. I laid the second envelope right next to it and put the oddly angled Polaroid of a building's top corner over it. I did this with each picture until they formed a grid that was about 5 by 10. I was taught to always be careful with things that I was collecting, even if I wasn't sure whether they were valuable or not. I realized that I hadn't actually looked at the majority of these pictures before. I may have paid them a passing glance when I opened the envelope to look for a letter, but upon being reliably disappointed, I would simply close the envelope and put it with the others. As I looked at them now, I noticed that the pictures gradually became more distinct. I scanned my eyes over the Polaroids. There was a tree with a bird on it, a speed limit sign, a power line, a group of people walking into some building. Right as my eyes were about to move on to the next photo in the sequence, they froze and focused on something that vexed me so powerfully that I can now, as I write this, distinctly remember feeling dizzy and capable of only a single repeating thought. Why am I in this picture? In the photograph of a group of people entering the building, I saw myself holding hands with my mother in the very back of the crowd of people. We were at the very edge of the photo, but it was us. As my eyes swam over the sea of Polaroids, I became increasingly anxious. It was a really odd feeling. It wasn't fear. It was the feeling you get when you are in trouble. I'm not sure why I was flooded with that feeling, but there I sat floundering in the distinct sense that I had done something wrong. This feeling only intensified as I managed to break my gaze and look at the rest of the pictures. I was in every photo. None of them were close shots. None of them were only of me. But I was in every single one of them. Off to the side, in the back of a group, at the bottom of the frame, some of the pictures had only the tiniest parts of my face captured at the very edge of the photo, but nevertheless, I was there. I was always there. For a moment, I tried to imagine this whole thing was one tremendous coincidence, but I knew that it wasn't, and I sat there stunned. I didn't know what to do. Your mind works in funny ways as a kid. There was a large part of me that was afraid of getting in trouble, simply for still being awake. I wanted to wake up my mother. I wanted to tell her that there was something wrong here. I wanted to run into her bedroom and throw the pictures onto her comforter and just shout, LOOK! And have her hug me and tell me that everything was going to be fine. That I had nothing to be afraid of. But I just sat there with the looming feeling of having made some irreparable transgression. I decided that I would wait until morning. The next day, my mom was off to work and spent most of the morning cleaning up around the house. I stared blankly at the cartoons on the television and waited until I thought it was a good time to show her the Polaroids. When she went out to get the mail, I grabbed a couple of the pictures and put them on the table in front of me. I sat waiting for her to come back in. 
I couldn't even think of how to begin, and I dug my fingernails into the chipping paint on the table as I tried desperately to think of the perfect way to explain everything. When she returned, she was already opening the mail. I heard her throw some junk mail into the trash can, and I took a deep breath and forced the words out of my mouth. Mom, can you come here? I have these pictures. Just give me a minute, honey. I need to mark these on the calendar. After a moment, she came and stood behind me and asked me what I needed. I could hear her shuffling with the mail, but I just looked at the Polaroids and told her about them. I reminded her about the balloon project and how I had only gotten a picture in my first correspondence. I told her that after that one, they just kept coming, but I never said anything because they were just stupid pictures. I dug my fingernails harder into the table and told her that I had saved them all and had gotten so excited when the dollar came back that I stayed up late looking at all the photos. As I went on in my explanation and pointed to the pictures, her frequent uh-huhs and okays decreased, and she was suddenly completely quiet and making only a little noise with the mail. I had run out of things to say, but I couldn't turn around and face her. I waited for her to say something, but the next noise I heard from her sounded as if she were trying to catch her breath in a room that had no air left in it. At last, she subdued her struggling gasps and simply dropped the remaining mail on the table right next to me and ran to the kitchen to get the cordless phone. Mom? I I'm sorry, I, I didn't know about these. Don't be mad at me. With the phone pressed to her ear, she was alternating running and walking back and forth while shouting into the mouthpiece. I couldn't understand what she was saying or who she could be calling. Was it my teacher? No, this wasn't her fault. I nervously fiddled with the mail that was sitting next to the Polaroids I had arranged. The top envelope had something sticking out of it that I thoughtlessly and anxiously pulled on until it came out. It was another Polaroid. Confused, I thought that somehow one of my Polaroids had slipped into the stack when she threw the mail down. But when I turned it over and looked at it, I realized that I had not seen this one before. It was me, but this one was a much closer shot. I was surrounded by trees and was smiling, but it wasn't just me. Josh was there too. I felt my mouth go dry as I realized that this was from yesterday. I started yelling for my mom, who was still screaming into the phone. As I called her more loudly, she shouted more loudly into the phone to compensate and this exchange repeated until she finally responded with, WHAT?! Suddenly, I had her attention, but I didn't know what to do with it. I could only think to ask, Who are you calling? I'm talking with the police, honey. B but why? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do anything. Please, Mom! She answered me with a response that I never understood until I was forced to revisit these events from the earliest years of my life. She grabbed the envelope off the table, and the picture of Josh and I spun and slid, landing next to the other Polaroids in front of me. She held the front of the envelope up to my eyes, but I could only look at her and watch as all the color began draining out of her face, as if something was siphoning the life right out of her. With tears welling up in her eyes, she said she had to call the police, because there was no postmark. Sleep tight.